Thank you.
The Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands will now come to order. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on seven public lands bills. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members to keep their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Due to the broad interest in today's hearing, I would like to ask unanimous consent that all interested members be allowed to join us and participate. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. Thank you all for attending the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands Legislative Hearing on seven public lands bills. I would like to extend my gratitude to the bill sponsors, as well as to our witnesses, for taking the time to be here with us today. Throughout these past few months, our nation has been in crisis, battling an unprecedented global pandemic that has thrown American lives into disarray. We are living in a new reality one where Americans have changed their daily routines and made personal sacrifices to protect one another from the coronavirus, one where countless individuals have joined together to help vulnerable communities. Now, as our country is coming to terms with another deadly crisis, the legacy of American racism that has permeated every facet of American society, I am hopeful that we as Americans will dedicate the same selfless courage and determination toward addressing the institutional racism that plagues our country. We're living with new constraints on how we conduct business, but this has not stopped the committee from continuing its oversight work and from elevating important perspectives. Since the start of the pandemic, the committee has held digital forums on critical issues, including the administration's decision to prematurely reopen national parks and wildfire response and preparedness during the coronavirus pandemic. Oversight remains a vital function of Congress today, maybe even more so than ever, but it is also Congress's job to find solutions, to consider and enact laws that help make our nation safer, more equitable, and a place that is representative of our shared humanity. The bills before the subcommittee today are an appropriate place for us to resume our legislative duties, as they touch on many of the priorities for this subcommittee. Today, we'll consider proposals that promote conservation and enhanced educational opportunities by improving land management efficiencies. We'll review legislation that will help bridge the digital divide between rural and urban communities, helping the nearly 30 million Americans stuck on the wrong side of the digital divide who have struggled to keep up in a world where stay-at-home orders increased everyone's reliance on the internet, reap the economic, educational, and public safety benefits that come with access to advanced broadband. We'll discuss bills that highlight the need to protect unique landscapes and stories representative of the American experience and that address impacts of unauthorized drone incursion on wildfire suppression. And we'll hear about the importance of recognizing and respecting traditional uses on our public lands. In my home state of New Mexico, Asequias and land grants have long played a critical role in our way of life. For more than a century, land grant communities in the Southwest have fought for recognition and access to their historic communal lands, which are necessary to sustain the land-based heritage and agricultural economies of many New Mexico communities. I would like to commend my good friend and colleague, Congressman Ben Ray Lujan, for his efforts to highlight the importance of land grants and acequias and to ensure enhanced access and consultation between the federal government and local stakeholders. Thank you again to the sponsoring members of Congress and witnesses here with us today. 
I look forward to hearing your insights into working with you all to move these important proposals through the legislative process. I now recognize the ranking minority member for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to begin my remarks today, unfortunately, by expressing disappointment at the lopsided nature of today's hearing uh, and the apparent disregard by the majority for this committee's bipartisan historic courtesy afforded to minority bills for legislative hearings of this nature. When Republicans controlled this committee, we, with very few exceptions, honored a three to one ratio for bills coming for consideration. Today, we meet to discuss eight bills, seven with a Democrat lead sponsor and only one with a Republican. While all the bills before us today certainly warrant thoughtful consideration from this subcommittee, I'd like to strongly urge my colleagues across the aisle to do a better job in the future of being more bipartisan. Please consider including more of the many serious and nationally helpful Republican bills that fall within the subcommittee's jurisdiction. Um, balance and decorum objections aside, I welcome the opportunity to discuss the bills before us today and hear from the respective witnesses. First, I'd like to highlight the Long Bridge Act offered by our National Resources Committee colleague from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. The bill authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to convey uh, an authorized temporary use of national uh, necessary federal property for the construction of a new computer commuter rail and pedestrian bridge that goes across the Potomac. Current law allows a right of way for railroads on most public federal lands, but not for railroads on National Park Service lands. Therefore, legislation is needed to authorize a small amount of National Park System land to be conveyed to Virginia to construct such a railroad. Long Bridge, the most heavily traveled railroad bridge connecting Washington, D.C. to Virginia and other states beyond, is one of the most significant choke points for the East Coast rail transportation system. The existing bridge, which is at 98% capacity during peak hours, is used by CSX freight trains, Amtrak long distance, state supported trains, as well as Virginia Railway Express commuter trains. The Long Bridge project will double the capacity of the Potomac River rail crossing by adding a second two track bridge adjacent to the existing one. Representative Whitman is to be commended for his hard work on the Long Bridge project and this legislation. We'll also be discussing several bills to add additional acreage to the National Park Systems, H.R. 7098, by Congressman or Chairman Grijalva, adds roughly 1,150 acres to the Saguaro National Park in Arizona. It authorizes a study to identify lands that would be a part of any future boundary adjustments for the park. H.R. 4840, offered by Representative O'Halloran, uh, expands the Casa Grande Ruins National Monument in Arizona by roughly 406 acres and authorizes several interagency land transfers for the San Carlos Irrigation Project. These two bills go about expanding park units the right way through an open deliberative process in Congress, not through mob rule, but there is a contention supported by major corporations that give hundreds of millions of dollars to the effort to eliminate democratic efforts regarding national monuments and allow Marxist groups to take over unilateral action to destroy any such recognition. In this case, we're talking about land as a national monument, and I'm glad we're going about it the right way. Uh, it should be noted, however, if we're going to use legal democratic process instead of mob rule that it's so popular these days, the Casa Grande Ruins National Monument is an example of the proper use of the Antiquities Act. Casa Grande Ruin Reservation was created in 1892 by order of President Benjamin Harrison and was the first prehistoric and cultural site to be established in the United States. In 1918, Woodrow Wilson, as president, proclaimed it to be Casa Grande National Monument. It consists of 480 acres. Finally, I'd like to share concerns about H.R. 4345, offered by Representative Luria of Virginia. The bill would expand Fort Monroe National Monument, which was established in 2011 by President Obama, 
Using the Antiquities Act, the bill would force the Secretary of Interior to accept by donation 44 acres of land adjacent to Fort Monroe, which is currently owned by the Commonwealth of Virginia. National Park Service has previously expressed concern about accepting those 44 acres because some of the lands and buildings to be donated need remediation from hazardous contaminants. This bill would abruptly end ongoing negotiations between the Park Service and Virginia and place the full cost of any decontamination cleanup on the federal government. And that's not a good approach, in my opinion. Uh, but I do thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to the testimony from the witnesses and thank the chair for her courtesy. Thank you. Thank you so much, ranking member. And uh, members, witnesses, I want to apologize to you that, um, as I mentioned earlier, I had technical difficulties. My computer crashed. And so uh, when I brought up the, the script, I brought up the wrong script. So with unanimous consent, I will submit um, my uh, the right script uh, for the record. But um, thank you, Mr. Gomer, for going through uh, the bills today that are in front of us, and I will, uh, and my uh, script will be in uh, the record. So, Madam Chair, uh, yes, we all understand computer glitches, so we certainly understand your situation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member. I appreciate that very much, Mr. Gomer. Um, so, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Gomer. Now, I would like to turn to our first panel and welcome the members of Congress who wish to testify on the bills they have sponsored. Let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will start and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining and red when your time has expired. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely use grid view so that they may pin the timer on their screen. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will also allow the entire panel to testify before questioning the witnesses. The chair now recognizes the gentle lady from Virginia, Ms. Luria. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Halen and Ranking Member Gomert for this opportunity to testify about my bill, H.R. 4345, the Fort Monroe National Monument Land Acquisition Act. Um, and I can proudly say that this is a bipartisan bill. Um, Mr. Whitman from Virginia, who is on this hearing, um, has sponsored my bill that I'm presenting today, and I have also been a co-sponsor of, of his bill, the Long Bridge Act. So I think we are working closely together for the, for the same goals um, relative to, to national parks, lands, um, and I appreciate your decision to hold a hearing on this bill and hope that it will be marked up and favorably reported to the House. Uh, despite its prominent, though somber, place in American history, too many remain unaware of the significance of Fort Monroe. In 1619, the first enslaved Africans arrived at, Port, at, at Point Comfort, which is modern day Fort Monroe. There they were traded as commodities and denied basic human dignity. And this was a defining moment that enabled our economy and government to be built on the backs of slaves. But Fort Monroe also became a beacon of liberty for African Americans. During the Civil War, Fort Monroe was a Union stronghold and was considered freedom's fortress for slaves escaping from Southern states. In 1960, Fort Monroe was designated as a National Historic Landmark. And in November 2011, President Obama established it as a national monument. Uh, Fort Monroe has recently uh, closed its military base, um, so the president worked to ensure that this critical location would be commemorated and honored appropriately. Uh, president Obama used his power under the Antiquities Act to establish nearly 325 acres as the national monument that we know today. Currently, approximately 40 acres of coastal land separates two important parts of Fort Monroe. While the Commonwealth of Virginia offered to donate this piece of land to the National Park Service to create a contiguous and federally managed coastline, the National Park Service has yet to accept this land. If signed into law, the Fort Monroe National Monument Land Acquisition Act will require the Secretary of the Interior to work with the Commonwealth to resolve issues related to management um, of several non-historic buildings on the land and to unify the two divided sections of land currently under the control of the National Park Service. Unifying the Fort Monroe National Monument will allow the National Park Service 
to better coordinate maintenance and development of educational opportunities on this site. Um, this bipartisan and bicameral legislation initiates a long overdue transfer of coastal land needed to protect this national monument. The United States stands at a pivotal, pivotal moment as centuries of slavery gave way to systemic racism and Congress must lead in reconciliation, remembrance, and awareness about this history. By passing the Fort Monroe National Monument Land Acquisition Act, future generations of Americans will continue to learn about Fort Monroe's hallowed history, and I hope it will help to inform a brighter and more equitable future. And thank you for allowing me to, to testify um, on this piece of legislation today, uh, and I look forward to, to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you so much, Ms. Luria. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Naguz. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, <laughs> Chair Hallen. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of two of my bills being considered during today's hearing, HR 5458, the Rocky Mountain National Park Boundary Modification Act, and HR 5459, the Rocky Mountain National Park Ownership Correction Act. These bills will expand and protect one of our most treasured and historic national parks, and one that I'm proud is located within Colorado's second congressional district, which of course I have the honor of serving in the United States Congress. Uh, just by way of background, established in 1915 by President Woodrow Wilson, Rocky Mountain National Park is home to many of our nation's iconic landscapes. People from all over the world are drawn to the park, each for their own reasons. I suspect many of my colleagues on the committee have uh, traveled to the park as well to experience nature, to seek solitude, to uh, really watch wildlife and partake in outstanding recreational activities. Uh, I myself hold a number of treasured memories in this special place, uh, hiking with my dad and my family, and of course making memories with loved ones. Um, it's something that holds deep meaning for many Americans and especially Coloradans. Because of this, uh, this really incredible um, uh, location, it, it would come as no surprise why the park continually breaks attendance records. In 2019, the park attracted 4.7 million visitors, breaking its record for the fifth time in six years. Uh, it, um, in 2019, actually, it maintained its position as the third busiest park in the national park system. And as more people are drawn to this special place, our appreciation only grows for those who seek to protect and expand it. Um, I want to first talk about uh, HR 5458, uh, which is uh, the bill that the witness testifying on behalf of today um, will be talking about. And the witness, uh, by way of background, is former astronaut Vance Brand. Uh, the Rocky Mountain National Park Boundary Modification Act would formally codify a generous donation of 40 acres of land into the park boundary made by Mr. Brand. The property is located adjacent to the eastern boundary of the park, and it would add additional protection for the park's high elevation ecosystem and provide recreational access between private lands and three very popular trails that connect to a network of hundreds of miles of trails. While this donation alone is worthy of recognition, it's hardly the only manner in which Mr. Brand has served his country. A native of Longmont, Colorado, Mr. Brand served as a commissioned officer and a naval aviator with the U.S. Marine Corps from 1953 to 1957. And following release from active duty, he continued in the Marine Corps Reserve and Air National Guard Jet Fighter Squadrons until 1964. Two years later, in 1966, Mr. Brown was one of 19 pilot astronauts selected by NASA. As an astronaut, he held management positions relating to spacecraft, development, acquisition, flight safety, and mission operations. He flew on four space missions, logged 746 hours in space, and he commanded three shuttle missions. It is inspiring to witness someone who has already served their country uh, in such an incredible fashion to remain steadfast in their selfless dedication to our country. And we all have so much to learn from Mr. Brand's example of public service, myself included. Uh, additionally, I'm proud today that we are considering uh, H.R. 5459, the Rocky Mountain National Park Ownership Correction Act. This bill would correct a bank error dating back to 1972, where a 0.18-acre plot of land containing the Forsyth family cabin was erroneously transferred to the Rocky Mountain National Park when the Park Service purchased a larger surrounding parcel. Uh, the family uh, seeking to retain legal ownership of its cabin and the plot on which it sits proposed an exchange of the properties, and, and that exchange has the support of the Rocky Mountain National Park as well as the Park Service. So in closing, uh, these bills are common sense measures to expand and protect Rocky Mountain National Park. They enjoy support from local stakeholders, including the town of Estes Park, Larimer County, and the Rocky Mountain Conservancy. 
Public lands are who we are as Coloradans. Uh, they drive our outdoor recreation economy. They inspire our commitment to sustainability. And these two bills will ensure uh, that we protect Rocky Mountain National Park for future generations like my daughters to enjoy. And I look forward to working with my colleagues to advance these pieces of legislation. And again, want to thank the chairwoman uh, for holding this important hearing and for giving us the opportunity to present these bills. And with that, I would yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Nagus. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop. Is Mr. Bishop here? Mr. Bishop. Uh I want to thank the chairwoman uh, Hayland and ranking member Young for giving me the opportunity to testify this afternoon on H.R. 5472, uh, the Jimmy Carter National Historic Park Redesignation Act. Uh, the legislation would change the name of the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site in Plains, Georgia, to the Jimmy Carter National Historical Park, thereby ensuring that its nomenclature conforms to other non-contiguous sites within the national park system. Uh, it would also honor the wish of our nation's 39th president, uh, who is a dear friend of mine, as well as my constituent. He and his wife, our former first lady, Rosalind Carter, last week promised to celebrate their 74th wedding anniversary. On March 27, 2019, President Carter also became our nation's longest president surpassing the lifespan of George H.W. Bush. Uh, this October, he will celebrate his 96th birthday. As many of you are aware, President Carter has had a number of health challenges recently, which has created a sense of urgency around this legislation and the rich legacy that he and Mrs. Carter want to leave to their longtime home in Plains. After the Carters left the White House, the Carters and the Plains community took the initiative to preserve and protect the history of this small rural home, uh, uh, this agricultural community. Uh, in 1987, Congress established the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. It consists of the Plains Railroad Depot, which served as Jimmy Carter's campaign headquarters during the 1976 presidential campaign, Jimmy Carter's boyhood farm, uh, Plains High School, which the Carters both attended, and now serves as the visitor center and museum, as well as the Carter home and compound where the Carters currently live and is now closed to the public. In fact, the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site is the only site in the national park system, aside from the White House, that is still an active presidential home. I've taken my entire staff there on a number of occasions so that they could get a better feel and understanding of the values that shaped this great Georgia. We listened to the messages recorded by the former president that tell visitors of his experiences as a child and young man and how they influenced his views. After touring the Depression era farm, home and school where he grew into manhood, every one of my staff members, uh, including a number from Georgia and several who are not, told me they were inspired by what they learned about the life of Jimmy Carter, just as I have been. I urge the subcommittee to support the redesignation. I look forward to working with you to ensure that the new Jimmy Carter National Historic Park continues to inspire generations of visitors as well as grow and positively impact the economy of Plains Rural. Thank you very much, and I, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Hines. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and, and to the ranking member and the members of this panel uh, for coming together today to discuss an important part of New England's national park system uh, and, the re and the designation change for Weir Farm National Historic Site. The legis this legislation establishes that the historic site focused primarily on the core parcel of land that included the Weir House, the home of Julian Alden Weir, a pioneer in American Impressionism. However, since its designation as a National Historic Site, Weir Farm has evolved to do much more than just honor the life and work of its namesake. 
The park, which now stretches across nearly 70 acres of land, is home to 16 historic buildings, a vast collection of American art, orchards and landscapes, trails, gardens, miles of stone walls, Weir's Pond, and over 250 historic painting sites. As a part of the Northeast Temperate Network, the team at Weir Farm monitors, analyzes, and shares information about the area's climate, water quality, forest health, and more with other parks in the region. Weir Farm National Historic Site also works closely with partner organizations, including Friends of Weir Farm National Historic Site, to develop innovative programs and attract new visitors. Youth organizations like Groundwork Bridgeport, Bridgeport being uh, the largest city in Connecticut and the uh, uh, largest city in my district, not far from Weir Farm, have partnered with the farm to provide young people with the opportunity to volunteer, perform service projects, or practice their craft in the park. Since 1998, Weir Farm Alliance, uh, Art Alliance, a nonprofit organization that works in tandem with the park, has honored the site's history by offering a rich artist in residence program that allows artists from across the globe to spend one month living and working at the park. Since its designation as a historic site, many of the park's landscapes and resources have been rehabilitated and restored to their original state, which inspired artists like Julian Alden Weir, Mahanri McIntosh Young, and Charles Sperry Andrews to produce their finest works. Weir Farm will garner even more attention in 2020 as the park is featured on the U.S. Mint's America the Beautiful Quarter, representing the state of Connecticut. Put simply, the park's current nomenclature does not capture the complexity and full scope of the site. Madam Chairwoman, changing the designation is the right thing to do, and it's the right time to do it. I very much appreciate the committee's attention to this bill and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so much, Mr. Himes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona and the chair of the full committee, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Gomer. Appreciate you holding this hearing and uh, affording us the opportunity to testify. Um, I know from my time as chair and ranking member of this subcommittee, that there are a lot of uh, locally specific measures to process. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my bill and learn about the others in today's, on today's schedule. My bill to expand the boundaries of Sawado National Park is something I've been working on for several years. And this latest version is a critical conservation game with widespread community support. I'm back, in Tucson, I'm back home in Tucson and thought about testifying from one of the proposed additions to the park as a backdrop, but it's 112 degrees right now today, so I'm logging in from the comfort of my uh, district office. Now, I'd welcome any of my colleagues to come for a visit when the weather is cooler and once the public health concerns are abated. Putting the heat aside, being surrounded by the Sonoran Desert and the protected corridors of Sobato National Park is what makes Southern Arizona such a special and unique place to live. For those of us who have, who, for those who have never visited the city of Tucson, uh, we are fortunate to be encompassed by the by the national park, the Tucson Mountain Dis District in the west, and the Rincon Mountain District in the east. It draws visitors to our humble corner of the world, and is a refuge and a place of solace for many residents. HR 7098 would modify the boundary of Sawato National Park and authorize the Secretary of Interior to acquire land adjacent to and near the park's two districts. Incorporating these parcels into the park will preserve important wildlife habitat, ensure quality recreation opportunities for the greater Tucson region. One important highlight is that the expansion will create a critical linkage between Sawato National Park and Pima County Sweetwater Preserve. Although the proposed additions will protect biodiverse riparian areas, altogether, the biodiverse riparian areas, wildlife habitat, scenic views, and important archaeological sites. By increasing habitat connectivity and recreational trail linkages in the area, this expansion bill is a win-win both for nature and people. And that's why I've been supporting this project uh, for so long, I, but I cannot take by any means take all the credit. We have had strong community partners like Pima County, the Tucson Mountain Association, the National Parks Conservation Association, to name a few. I, and one of the witnesses today, I want to welcome Kevin Dahl, uh, the Arizona State Director of NPCA, 
uh, to be here and thank him for taking the time to visit uh, with us today. He has been a tremendous, he has put a tremendous amount of energy into this project. I look forward to hearing his perspective and how the bill will, how the bill came together and then brought the broad support for this proposal in Southern Arizona and Tucson. With that, Madam Chair, I yield the rest of my time and thank the chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grijalva. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you to, uh, to you and the ranking member for holding this hearing today. I want to start by thanking uh, both of you for allowing this bill, H.R. 7489, the Long Bridge Act of 2020, to receive a legislative hearing today. And I also want to thank the witnesses for being here to discuss these important pieces of legislation. In particular, I want to thank Virginia Secretary of Transportation, Shannon Valentine, for appearing today in support of the legislation and for her dedication to the Long Bridge Project. Finally, I want to thank Congress members Beyer, Holmes Norton, Wexton, Connolly, Bobby Scott, Klein, Griffith, Luria, Spamberger, and Brown for their co-sponsorship and their support. H.R. 7489, the Long Bridge Act of 2020, comes after numerous years of successful negotiation between the Commonwealth of Virginia, the District of Columbia, and CSX, and culminated in a December 2019 landmark agreement to expand reliability and service on Virginia's rail lines, creating a pathway to separate passenger and freight operations along the Richmond to Washington, D.C. corridor. The first district includes I-95 corridor in Prince William and Stafford counties and the city of Fredericksburg, which includes the worst traffic hotspot in the nation. Addressing the congestion issues along the I-95 corridor is essential to improving transportation in the region. Long Bridge is the most heavily traveled railroad bridge connecting Washington, D.C. to Virginia and other southern states, and it's one of the most significant choke points for the East Coast rail transportation system. The bridge connects the Northeast and Southeast freight rail networks and extends the spine of the nation's inner city passenger rail system from the Northeast corridor to the Southeast. The existing bridge, which is at 98% capacity during peak hours, is used by CSX, CSX freight trains, Amtrak long distance, state supported trains, and the Virginia Railway Express commuter trains. The Long Bridge project would double the capacity of the Potomac River rail crossing by adding a second two-track bridge adjacent to the existing bridge. This project, which supports projected increases in freight and passenger rail traffic along this corridor, is crucial to continued economic growth and enhanced mobility in Virginia. It will also increase the capacity of the rail network for the Port of Virginia, where 37% of the goods move in and out by rail. The Port of Virginia will need to increase this share to 45% by 2040, to handle a threefold increase in shipments. Building a new long bridge, which will double rail capacity at the major bottleneck on CSX's main route from the Port of Virginia to the Midwest and Northeast is imperative to the ports and Virginia's economic growth strategies. The proposed design is a new two-track bridge upstream of the current long bridge with five additional bridges in Virginia and DC. Along with the fourth track projects in this area, this project will, will create a four track corridor from just south of the Union Station to Alexandria. This bill will authorize the Secretary of the Interior through the National Park Service Director to convey and to authorize the use by Virginia and the District of Columbia, a small section of the National Park Service land for the construction of the new Long Bridge structure for rail and for additional walkable, bikeable pedestrian bridge spanning the Potomac River. The bill will also convey title and interest to Virginia of about 4.4 permanent acres of the National Park Service land. Also, the National Park Service will authorize Virginia to temporarily use 8.44 acres of land for the construction, which will revert back to the National Park Service at the discretion of the NPS director when the project is completed. A new long bridge will go a long way to creating or easing conge congestion along the I-95 corridor and cut down on commuter travel time that plagues many Virginia residents. Construction of a separate passenger only bridge will allow freight to move more freely from the Port of Virginia taking thousands of large trucks off the road. This land conveyance is required for the construction of the bridge. 43 USC sections 934 and 938 allows a right away in federal lands, but not for railroads in National Park Service land. Therefore, the legislation 
is needed to authorize the National Park Service land to be transferred to Virginia to construct a railroad. Expanding corridor capacity is an economic catalyst for the whole region. Six billion annually in, e in economic benefits is expected by 2040 to the greater Washington metropolitan area. This expansion is critical to the 1.3 million Amtrak passengers and the 4.5 million Virginia Railway Express commuters that cross the Long Bridge each year, easing crowded and congested commutes. This legislation has the support of the Commonwealth of Virginia, the District of Columbia, CSX, as well as the Virginia Railway Express and Amtrak. Thank you again, Chairwoman Halen, for your support and for Ranking Member uh, Gomert's uh, kind words and consideration of H.R. 7489, and I urge the subcommittee's support of this critical legislation. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Uh, and I thank all the members of Congress, the sponsoring members of Congress, for their valuable testimony. Now we will transition to our second panel. As with the first panel, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but your entire statement will be made part of the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will start and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining and red when your time has expired. After the witness has testified, members will be given the opportunity to ask questions. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Mamie E. Locke, who represents the second district in the Virginia State Senate. Ms. Locke, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chair Holland, Ranking Member Gomert, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Mamie Locke. I am a member of the Senate of Virginia and a member of the Board of Directors of the Fort Monroe Authority, where I have served since its inception as an organization. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on HR 4345, a bill to provide for the acquisition of land in the Fort Monroe National Monument. Fort Monroe is a special historic place. It is the site of the first landing of Africans in America in 1619. A young first lieutenant and engineer, Robert E. Lee, was stationed at Fort Monroe from 1831 to 1834. Following the 1832 Black Hawk War, the Army briefly detained Chief Black Hawk at the fort. In 1861, Fort Monroe became known as Freedom's Fortress, as General Benjamin Butler made his famous contraband decision and the great contraband camp was built for the thousands of slaves who escaped to the fort. And the great underground railroad conductor, Harriet Tubman, worked there as a nursing cook for a time in 1861. Following the Civil War, former Confederate President Jefferson Davis was imprisoned at the fort at what is now the Casemate Museum. So this is the place with this history and many, many stories of, to tell that I am here to talk to you about today. As a political subdivision of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Fort Monroe was deeded to the state by the U.S. Army following the closure and decommissioning of the installation. Under the Antiquities Act of 1906, President Barack Obama proclaimed Fort Monroe a national monument on November 1, 2011, established, establishing it as a unit of the National Park Service, consisting of cultural landscapes and outdoor recreation open spaces along the Chesapeake shoreline, three historic buildings, the historic parade ground, and an easement over and inside the moated historic fortress. Additionally, the Commonwealth transferred ownership of two parcels of land inside the stone fortress, nine acres known as the inner fort, along with 112 acres known as North Beach to the United States while providing historic preservation and an access easement for nearly 93 acres around and including the historic stone fortress. Since the establishment of the monument, the FMA and the National Park Service have worked collaboratively to optimize efficient and effective preservation and adaptive management of the nationally significant structures and landscapes, having mutually adopted the overarching management theme of one Fort Monroe. Since the establishment of the monument, it has become clear to both parties that the significant separation between the 92-acre easement boundary and the 112-acre North Beach parcel diminishes the functionality and the cohesion being sought for the, a one Fort Monroe, and that the closure of the physical gap separating elements of the monument is highly desirable. In 2016, the National Park Service indicated it could accept a donation of 44 acres of land that would provide a physical connection between the two divided sections of the monument, 
to achieve an unbroken coastline along the Chesapeake Bay from Old Point Comfort north to the end of the property. Consequently, in 2016, the Fort Monroe Board unanimously approved a resolution to support transfer of the 44 acre parcel from the Commonwealth to the United States in order to buttress the partnership between the National Park Service and the Commonwealth by completing the long plan connection to better balance and rationalize the respective responsibilities of the partners for properties at Fort Monroe. Now it is critically important that we move forward with the state federal unification plan, making one Fort Monroe a reality. I thank you for your time and attention and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Locke. The chair now recognizes Mr. Barnaby V. Lewis, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Gila River Indian Community. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Barnaby Lewis. I'm a tribal member of the Gila River Indian Community. We are Akimur Atam, Akimur River Atam as people, but we're fairly recognized as the Pima of Southern Arizona. Our community was established in 1859, and uh, we have two tribes here. Uh, the other tribe is the uh, Pipash, also known as the Maricopa. Totally different tribe, their own cultural ways, and they are related to the human tribe from along the Colorado River. The Autum have four fairly recognized tribes and four different communities. The Tonawatam Nation, the Action Indian Community, and the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community. The Hoatam communities have a group shared identity. We speak the same language. Our songs, our dances, our stories of creation, as well as our traditional religious practices and rituals are very similar. And uh, we <clears throat> want to express our support appreciation for allowing uh, our community, Hill River, to provide these comments this morning for the Casa Grande Ruins uh, National Monument uh, modification on their boundary. Uh, this was originally pursued back in the early years, back in 2010, where all the four Southern tribes have uh, all supported and continue to support this proposed legislation and expansion. Presently, you know, the Casa Grande Ruins National Monument encompasses 473 acres of federal land that is managed by the National Park Service. This bill would make some small boundary adjustments to the National Monument. It would uh, authorize incorporation of portions of the Guru site, another Uhukam ancestral site, just to the east of the community of. Uh, Casa uh, Grande Ruins, uh, through the cooperative management of a 200 acre parcel of state land in Arizona, the bill would also help protect and interpret a nearby ancestral village known today as Adamsville. I want to express our sincere perspective and connections with archaeological sites to say that these places, you know, define and establish the connections of all of them have with their Hugum ancestors. The spiritual, reverent associations assist us in maintaining our links to these ancestral and sacred places. Spiritual associations are sacred places in the landscape define that existence to the extent that the autumn world, these places are not just historically significant by virtue of their role in annual cycles and universal and spiritual renewal, religious practice and traditional knowledge. They are critical to art and belief, uh, cultural perpetuation and survival. How can we not them traditional knowledge? You know, in the case of the Christ Grandi settlement was known as Sur. It was governed by a powerful chief named the United States has a long history of preserving, you know, Casa Grande uh, Romans uh, National Monument. In 1892, President 
Benjamin Harrison signed an executive order preserving the monument and 480 acres that surround it. It's the very first archaeological preserve established in the United States. Uh, in Hornets local communities in the state of Arizona, local residents in both Coolidge and Foreign Arizona are strong supporters of this bill and to the economic importance of Casa Grande Ruin in this area. The GRC endorses this expansion. This is very, uh, there's very strong uh, bipartisan support from Arizona representatives in Congress. And our two senators have introduced a companion bill in the Senate. I often believe that everything within this proposed boundary extension is of great cultural significance as such places serve as uh, messages to us regarding how we should continue to continue our traditional ways of life. Uh, in conclusion, the four Southern tribes, as I mentioned earlier, affirm and support the boundary modification that will be significant benefit to the American public and all the culturally affiliated tribes. Thank you for the invitation for me to provide this testimony for this hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. The chair now recognizes Representative Nagus for 30 seconds to introduce his witness, Mr. Vance Brandt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm honored to introduce former astronaut Vance Brand, originally from Longmont, Colorado. He graduated from Longmont High School, uh, received his bachelor's like me at the University of Colorado, a fellow CU Buff. As I mentioned earlier, from 1953 to 1957, he served as a commissioned officer and a naval aviator with the U.S. Marine Corps, and he continued in the Marine Corps Reserve and Air National Guard jet fighter squadrons until 1964. He was also one of the 19 pilot astronauts selected by NASA in 1966, successfully flying on four space missions logging 746 hours in space and commanding three shuttle missions. Uh, and we're so honored uh, again by his decision uh, with respect to the donation to Rocky Mountain National Park and to, to introduce him here today in front of the committee. Chair uh, and uh, committee. I'm really be happy to be here and appreciate the uh, invitation. Uh, our brand family seeks to donate 40 acres of mountain land, which borders Rocky Mountain National Park. The beautiful undeveloped property is at an altitude of nine to 10,000 feet uh, above sea level along the eastern uh, boundary of the park. I was born and raised as Longmont in Longmont, Colorado, uh, not far from Rocky Mountain National Park, and spent several pleasant summers during high school and early college days working in Estes Park, initially as operator of the old manual elevator at the historic uh, Stanley Hotel and later as a busboy in a downtown restaurant. During days off, my friends and I enjoyed exploring Rocky Mountain National Park by making trips, which usually consisted of uh, long trail hikes and non-professional mountain climbing. I climbed Long's Peak, the highest mountain in the park, uh, over a dozen times. Rocky Mountain National Park gave me a lot of enjoyment and great experiences, which I'll always remember. After graduation from the University of Colorado, I spent four years as mentioned in the Marine Corps and returned to CU for an engineering degree uh, later. After that, I went to work with the Lockheed California Company in Burbank, California as a flight test engineer and later transferred to Palmdale as a test pilot. I signed on with NASA in 1966, uh, traveled a lot and never returned to Colorado to live. 
uh, but continue to appreciate the magnificent Colorado Rockies. In 1967, I purchased 160 acres of the pristine mountain land bordering the park for $32,000. The 40 acres that our family is donated is donating is located in the northwest portion of that original 160 acre parcel about four miles northeast of Lo the Long's Peak summit. The land is rugged, consisting of lodgepole pine and subalpine fir forests and grassy meadows with aspen groves. Park trails run on federal property close to the developed or the donated uh, 40 acres. So the donated land should add to the buffer between these trails. We have seen much wildlife there uh, nearby, including deer, elk, mountain sheep, and more. Our family camped on the property each summer, and I believe that our family instilled a love of the property into our kids. We continue to have family reunions there most years. At first, we intended to build a cabin there, but as we grew older, those desires changed. And that's partly because I trail, uh, traveled a lot with NASA. Now we don't want to see the property developed. That is the biggest reason that my wife, Bev, our six children and I are donating 40 acres of the land to the national park. We hope that it will be preserved in its natural state and enjoyed by the American people. Also, I consider it to be payback for the many benefits that I have received by being able to live my life in our American democracy. Media in nearby cities in Northern Colorado and the University of Colorado have been positive on the donation. And we've been very grateful for the support given by Senators Michael Bennett and Cory Gardner and Congressman Joe Neguse. I hope that you will consider this donation to be a win-win for the National Park Service and the American people. And uh, thank you for uh, letting me tes testify here today. Thank you so much, Mr. Vance. Thank you for your service to our country. We're very grateful to you. Thank you, sir. The chair now recognizes Ms. Elizabeth Castagna, Vice President of the Friends of Weir Farm National Historic Site. Good afternoon, Chair Holland, Ranking Member Gomer, and members of the committee. And thank you for this opportunity to testify today in support of HR 5852. The Weir Farm National Historical Park Redesignation Act proposes to change the park's designation from a National Historic Site to a National Historic Park to more accurately reflect the park's acreage, rich history, and artistic legacy numerous natural and cultural resources, and abundant recreational opportunities. My name is Elizabeth Castagna, and I am the Vice President on the Board of the Friends of Weir Farm National Historic Site, a not-for-profit volunteer organization that works in partnership with the park. The Friends of Weir Farm enhance the visitor experience and continue the park's artistic creative legacy through seasonal programs, such as our Junior Ranger Days and special projects, including the recent refurbishing and opening of the historic Weir Barn. Weir Farm National Historic Site was established as a national park unit in 1990 to preserve and interpret the historically significant properties and landscapes associated with Julian, with the life and work of Julian Alden Weir, the American Impressionist. 
for the first 16 years of the park, the park's development was constrained by a life tenancy. In 2006, Rear Farm National Historic Site began a comprehensive rehabilitation and restoration of over 80% of its historic resources and landscapes, leading to the park's reopening in 2014. In addition to preserving Rear's studio and home, the park includes extensive fields, gardens, trails, woods, and the Weir Pond. Weir Farm National Historic Site has grown to approximately 70 acres since the original designation in 1990, covering many related stories over a period of 135 years of artistic relevance and extensive natural resources that had not been inventory or known at the time of the designation. It is Connecticut's first national park unit and the only unit in the National Park Service dedicated to an American painter. But the park goes far beyond that, interpreting the work and lives of several artistic generation stories, as well as a vibrant contemporary art community, utilizing the landscape today for painting outdoors. Weir's work was instrumental in defining American Impressionism and the site is integral to his artistic vision and to the growth of a national style of painting. The documentation of over 250 painting sites throughout Weir Farm National Historic Site and the adjoining Weir Preserve has led to innovative natural resource management and proved to, it to be a model for other parks to manage landscape and scenery. We believe the designation Weir Farm National Historical Park most accurately states what the park has become. This place, which includes several historic houses and three art studios, two historic barns, multiple outbuildings, and a scenic landscape of gardens, fields, woods, along with a pond, stone walls, and other features, is much more than a historic site. A title that suggests a single building or a place such as a battlefield. National historic sites generally are only a few acres in size with limited natural resources, discrete boundaries, and a single narrative. Typically, a historic site conveys a particular moment in history, not a place with a rich national history, generations of artists and art movements. The Friends of Weir Farm enthusiastically support this redesignation as a national historical park to properly reflect Weir Farm's acreage, number of historic themes and artists, natural and cultural resources, trails, fishing and other recreation, and national impact. This redesignation will also recognize increase in public access, trails, collaboration with partners, and public programming since the park was restored and reopened in 2014. Changing the name of this extraordinary place to a national historical park will communicate much more clearly to the public what this property is today and will better represent the park's complex cultural, natural, and recreational resources. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Friends of Weir Farm in support of this legislation. Thank you very much, Ms. Castagna. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Kevin Dahl, Arizona Senior Program Manager for the National Parks Conservation Association. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Kevin Dahl, Arizona Senior Program Manager for National Parks Conservation Association. Uh, my organization will provide written testimony for the record on additional bills before the committee, but I'm grateful to be here for this opportunity to let you know of our strong support of HR 7098, the Saguaro National Park Boundary and Expansion and Study Act of 2020. This bill would expand the park's boundary to encompass approximately 1,150 acres of non-federal land adjacent to the current boundary, with 37 small but important parcels to be included in the new boundaries of both units of the park. As part of the effort to further protect this landscape, all landowners in this expansion package have been contacted about this effort, and none have expressed opposition. One landowner is a world-traveling professional outdoor photographer who has managed his property as a wildlife sanctuary hoping someday it would be included in the park. Another, a native Arizonan, has always known that the piece of land he owns has outstanding natural resource values and belongs in the park. 
Two parcels are owned by Pima County, which obtained this land under their open space bond program so that they could turn it over to the Park Service once the boundary expansion has been approved. The bill also includes a county road right of way so the park can better manage the Calle Loma Alta trailhead. And it includes a transfer from the Bureau of Land Management of land in a building that currently the park uses, but is no longer needed by the Bureau of Land Management. Several parcels located along the southern boundary of the park's Rincon Mountain District include portions of Rincon Creek, a gallery, riparian forest, and superb wildlife habitat. Water is so precious in the desert, and this is the only riparian hardwood woodland in the park. It's home to such rare species as Greyhawk, yellow-billed cuckoo, giant spotted whiptail lizard, and lowland leopard frog. Recreation will be well served by several of the additions. One parcel abuts the popular Camino de Este trailhead. Another is very close to the Sweetwater Trail, and when added to the park, will protect the scenic view hikers enjoy when taking this route up to Wasson Peak, and most people just assume that it's already in the park. Several of the parcels will link the popular Sweetwater Preserve, owned by Pima County, to the park. Their inclusion will protect view sheds, allow continued wildlife travel between the two areas, and eventually will allow connecting hiking trails from the preserve to the park. When Saguaro National Park was established as a monument, both units were far from Tucson city limits. Over time, the area has grown dramatically and new developments have consumed natural areas in many cases right up to the border of the park. With the support of local landowners and jurisdictions, this legislation will go far toward preserving vital habitat, protecting recreational opportunities, and just enhancing a wonderful national park. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in favor of this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. We appreciate you. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Sam Valentine, Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Secretary Valentine, you have five minutes. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Holland, Ranking Member Gilmore, members of the subcommittee, and my fellow witnesses um, testifying today. I'm also very honored to be before you to support H.R. 7489, a measure that will authorize the transfer of the National Park Service land to the Commonwealth of Virginia and the District of Columbia to construct the Long Bridge Rail Project. I'm very thankful to Congressman Rob Whitman for championing this legislation and for providing me this opportunity be, to be with you today. I also thank Congressman Don Beyer, who co-sponsored this bill, along with these distinguished members of Congress, Jennifer Wexton, Jerry Conley, Bobby Scott, Abigail Spamberger, Morgan Griffith, Donald McKeachin, Ben Klein, and Ellen, Elaine Luria. I believe that is our entire bipartisan delegation from Virginia. And from the District of Columbia, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, and Congressman Anthony Brown from Maryland. This legislation, also has very strong support of business, industry, and the environmental community. Why is this important? The existing CSX two-track Long Bridge was built in 1904 and reinforced in 1942. This bridge is the main link between the Southeast and the Northeast for both freight and passenger rail traffic and currently carries, as Congressman Whitman said, 80 freight passenger and freight passenger and commuter trains a day resulting in 98% capacity during peak periods. Before the Long Bridge, and because it is a critical part of our infrastructure with national significance, unlocking the gridlock at the bridge will support national security and the economic vitality of our nation by significantly expanding rail capacity and providing essential network redundancy to support passenger rail and multimodal freight movements while also connecting workers to key employment centers. Virginia has seen record number of passengers in recent years on rail, with nearly 1 million riders on state-supported Amtrak since during 2019, and more than 4.4 million riders on BRE. Increased passenger rail service is needed to accommodate a growing Virginia and support the entire East Coast as an alternative to traveling on the heavily congested I-95 border. In 2019, the Virginia Department of Transportation completed an I-95 corridor improvement plan. It found that additional general purpose lanes will not address the capacity needs of the 95 corridor 
and recommended a multifaceted, multimodal approach. It further determined that widening I-95 by just one lane in each direction for about 50 miles from 495 south to Thornburg would cost an estimated $12 billion. And by the time the construction was completed in 10 years, the quarter would be just as congested as it is today. With a new long bridge, additional passenger rail would be a part of the critical multimodal solution, providing capacity at less than a third of the investment. Work to consider improvements to rail infrastructure between Arlington and the district began in 2016, funded in part by Tiger Funds. This effort was led by the district Department of Transportation in partnership with FRA, the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation, and the National Park Service. The Long Bridge EIS study is nearly complete with final environmental clearance and the record of decision from FRA due this fall. While the EIS process has been ongoing, Virginia has been working side by side on a parallel path with CSX. These collaborative negotiations resulted in a landmark agreement between Virginia and CSX, which was announced on December 19, 2019. The full agreement, a $3.7 billion rail initiative, will double rail service, increase freight capacity from the Port of Virginia to the Northeast and Midwest, construct the Long Bridge and its program of projects, and include the acquisition of 350 miles of right-of-way and 225 miles of track, laying the path for the future for separating freight and passenger rail. As we have been advancing this project and conferring with the National Park Service, it was determined that Title 43 of the U.S. Code does not permit railroads, unlike highways, to be built through federal park lands without congressional approval. With the help and guidance of NPS, we work closely with members of our Virginia congressional delegation, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton in DC, as well as the National Park Service to draft the required legislative language shown now in HR 7489. We would not be here today without the National Park Service and we are sincerely grateful. I again thank Congressman Whitman for introducing HR 7489 and for doing such an excellent job in explaining it. This bill will authorize the Secretary of the Interior to transfer MPS lands to Virginia and the District of Columbia to construct the Long Bridge Rail Project. Senators Warner, Kane, and Van Hollen are working on similar language in the Senate. On behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I respectfully ask for your favorable consideration of H.R. 7489, your advancement of the Long Bridge Act of 2020, is a fundamental milestone in making this once in a generation opportunity a true reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Valentine. And thank you all for that valuable testimony. I'm reminding the members that committee rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions. The chair will now recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. And I'd like to first recognize Mr. Nagus for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. And again, thank you to all the witnesses uh, who testified today uh, during this hearing on these very important bills. Mr. Brand, I wonder if you might expound a bit on uh, kind of your memories of Rocky Mountain National Park, why, why the park is so important to you. Uh, you, of course, touched on that during your opening remarks. But uh, you know, we all, I know, are indebted to you for your service to our country. Uh, and are so grateful for your inspiration, inspiring us, of course, as an astronaut, and now inspiring us uh, with your generosity. And so I just wonder if you might be able to expound a bit on um, your particular connection to Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, <clears throat> uh, while I work uh, in Estes Park, as I mentioned, uh, I had a lot of opportunity to explore the park uh, used to take long trips. Uh, and one day, for example, from, uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with some of these places, but, uh, for example, from, uh, uh, the Estes Park side over to the 
Grand Lakeside. I think the longest trip in one day was 22 miles. I couldn't begin to do that now. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, well, uh, one memorable trip was uh, in the middle of winter, uh, going on snowshoes with a friend up to uh, Lawn Lake, which, uh, and then from there up to Crystal Lake above Timberline and uh, staying overnight in the cabin and hearing the the ice crack on the lake. And uh, well, I just had many, many experiences. Like I said, many in my family uh, appreciate the park too. Many have taken, uh, have climbed Long's Peak. And so as a family, uh, we just have come to believe that the land should be pre preserved as it is. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Brand. And I certainly am familiar with uh, th those places that you mentioned and uh, have, the dis have the honor of being able to represent them now in the United States Congress. And, um, and it's just wonderful to be able to hear you share some of your memories about what has made uh, you know, such a lasting impression on you in terms of the park. Um, and of course, I know many of us have those same experiences in a wide variety of public places and, and, and wilderness areas across the country. And I certainly have similar experiences to those that you've recounted both with my father and now with my, uh, with my daughter. Um, so again, we're very grateful to you and to your family's generosity. Uh, you know, as you said, and I think articulated, this really is a win-win, a win-win for Rocky Mountain National Park, for the National Park Service, for the United States Congress, and of course, uh, for uh, American citizens, for families across the country who uh, are able to enjoy uh, the beauty and, and the majesty of Rocky Mountain National Park. So we're grateful to you uh, for, for stepping forward. And I hope you'll give our best regards and thanks to uh, your wife and, and to your family and extended family. And we look forward to, to welcoming you uh, to the park uh, once this bill is uh, signed into law, which we'll certainly keep pushing uh, as we shepherd the bill along in this process. And with that, um, I would yield back uh, to the chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vance. Thank you, Mr. Nagus. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Gomert for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I majored in history in college, and, and one of the things I enjoy about these hearings is getting to continue to learn so much and, and learn new history. Um, and I knew all about Fort Monroe. I knew a lot about Fort Monroe having been in the Army, but I did not know that it was ever a refuge for people that should have been free, uh, but weren't at the time. So I, I, it's obviously a very important uh, location and certainly worthy of being protected and being a, an important part of our history and the march toward freedom. Uh, but I was, I, I was curious, and I'm glad Senator Locks you made a very compelling case. But I'm curious, uh, do you know what the status is of the um, efforts to get decontamination done uh, on the property that is uh, being sought to transfer to the Park Service? Uh Thank you, sir, for your question. Uh, I know that there is um, work being done in terms of trying to find out if indeed there are environmental hazards and if there, if remediation is needed. There will be a meeting between um, leadership of the National Park Service and leadership of the Fort Monroe Authority that will be taking place later this month uh, to determine what those what the issues are and what remediation may be needed. Well, that, that's good to hear, uh, and I, I hope that uh, uh, as this goes forward that that those efforts will continue uh, because it may help the bill as uh, it moves uh, to the full committee. So I hope you will encourage them to keep that up and keep moving toward um, getting something accomplished there to help with the decontamination. Uh, and uh, I also, you know, I've heard Rob Whitman, our congressman colleague, uh, talk about, you know, how 
tough. I know he's been working on uh, getting this bridge done for a long time. Uh, and Secretary Valentine, we're glad you would join us. But I'm curious, as, as hard as the work that Congressman Whitman has been doing and you've been doing, what's and, and them finding out just how critical uh, more rail space is uh, for a bridge across the Potomac at that place, What's been the major holdup? This seems like a no-brainer that we really do need this. Uh, and I hear uh, Rob Whitman's presentation and your presentation. What's been the holdup? This sounds like a natural thing that should have already been done. It, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, Ranking Member Gomart, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you say no-brainer. Um, as we were going through the EIS process, that's when we really discovered that in order for land for the mm. Commonwealth um, to have this partnership and to actually construct a rail project um, across federal lands um, from the National Park Service that we needed this congressional authorization to do it. So it was something that the district, the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, FRA, the, the National Park Service, all uncovered together, and it's been a real partnership to make sure that we get this milestone done. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. Ranking Member Gower. Yes, uh, just, please. Yeah, just just one, one thing to add. You know, we, we had a lot of conversations leading up to this, or multiple meetings with the National Park Service to see if we could do this administratively. And as we looked further and further into Title 43, it allowed road right away to be conveyed but not rail right away so it's one of those things that really i think is an oversight when the code was put together uh, you would think the older means of transportation being railroads that it would actually include railroads and roads but it doesn't so it, it would be a good thing going forward to actually have the code include railroads on these pieces of national park service land so that would be something for the national resource natural resources committee to think about in the future but we exhausted every administrative possibility trying to make it work, but the code was just very specific about roads, not railroads. So our hats off to the National Park Service. They did everything they could on the existing law, uh, but said that they would need legislation. So here we are. But it, it's a great example. I want to emphasize how great an example this is of public-private partnerships between CSX, the current rail owner, uh, and what they are willing to do to invest in this, what the state of Virginia is willing to do, and then too, what, what federal dollars can be brought to bear here. This is a great example about how to solve some transportation issues with looking across the spectrum, being able to, uh, to get resources to a major issue in moving both freight, which is key to getting trucks off the road and passenger traffic there in this particular region. This will, this will be a godsend to alleviate that pressure, and you heard Secretary Valentine talk about it. You can't keep putting down asphalt because you won't keep up with it. Rail is one of the critical elements of it. So I want to thank the committee. I want to thank uh, uh, Chairwoman Holland and and Ranking Member Gomert yourself for what you've done in helping us get this uh, taken care of. So thank you again. Thank you, Chair. My time's expired, and thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranking Member Gomert. Thank you to everyone. Um, I will next go to uh, Chairman uh, Grijalva for questions. Madam Chair, just one quick question uh, uh, for Mr. Dahl, of course. Uh, uh, Kevin, I think uh, one, of, one of the straw men that we confront on these expansion questions is that uh, we might hear that about this bill is that any proposal to expand a national park or public land in general that it, that'll lead to condemnation and abuse of government domain authority or some other uh, characterization. Could you tell us about the outreach that has been done, property owners in the footprint of the proposed expansion, and why uh, they support this bill? I think it's going to be a question that comes up, and it's, it would be good to have your response on the record now. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Chairman Grijalva. Yeah, we reached out to every property owner in the bill. Anyone reluctant or opposed to be included in, in the bill or in the park uh, were not included at all. Uh, but we found that most people we contacted were not only willing, but were enthusiastic about being part of the effort. You know, for some, it just means that, you know, the federal government becomes uh, another potential 
buyer of their land at some point down the line. But many, I think, like most people in Tucson, just love Soro National Park. It's it's a huge asset. They know the land they own is special. Um, and to see it protected in a natural state by having it added to Soro National Park would just be in alignment with the values, you know, that brought them to purchase the land in the first place. Um, uh, there won't be any condemnation. There, there, there won't be um, there won't be any adverse eminent domain used uh, in purchasing because the Park Service just doesn't do that uh, and has many opportunities to buy important land. So anybody who doesn't want to be included, well, they're not included. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva. And I will now recognize myself for questions. Um, Senator Locke, given the fact that more than 80% of the Chesapeake Bay shoreline is privately owned, can you touch on some of the benefits HR 4345 has in terms of recreational access to the bay? Part of your question was uh, I didn't hear. Chair Grijalva, will you mute your line, please? Please. Okay, I'll repeat it. Senator Locke, given the fact that more than 80% of the Chesapeake Bay shoreline is privately owned, can you touch on some of the benefits HR 4345 has in terms of recreational access to the bay? Uh, the, the most important part about uh, this legislation is that uh, the partnership between the National Park Service and the Fort Monroe Authority has been to create what what has been called the state federal partnership of one Fort Monroe and creating um, this uh, important place of historic and significance of Fort Monroe itself um, and opening up this historic place to the public, uh, not just the, um, the national park part of it, but the entire place uh, to the public as a welcoming place to everyone. And given its historic significance and all of the things that I named in my opening statement, this becomes a part of the visitors, the visitor center, which uh, will be opening up as soon as we get through this pandemic uh, that creates that history and, um, and not just the shoreline itself, mm -hmm. but, uh, the entire space becomes an open welcoming place to the entire nation. Uh, the National Park Service, Fort Monroe itself. Um, and uh, so everything becomes a welcoming opening space that shows the history of this country, uh, African-American history, Native American history, all history that is a part of America's history be, will become a part of uh, telling our country's story. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And it's my understanding, Senator Locke, that the Department of the Interior has refused to accept the donation offered by the Commonwealth of Virginia through the administrative process due to the Trump administration's opposition to the federal land acquisition. As the state senator who represents the area, would you say that your constituents are generally supportive of the acquisition? Yes, that's true. Everyone is supportive of this acquisition. Considering the immense historical significance of Fort Monroe, do you believe that the administration's cost concerns are outweighed by the benefits of enhancing protections for the site? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Mr. Lewis, is Mr. Lewis still with us? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm still here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, it's sometimes it's hard to see. Um, Mr. Lewis, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. As you stated in your testimony, Casa Grande Ruins is a deeply spiritual place considered sacred by many tribal communities. Given your background and experiences as a tribal historic preservation officer, can you briefly elaborate on the cultural and archeological significance of the Casa Grande Ruins? I mean, just, just uh, I mean, we, I know what it means to Native Americans, what will it mean to the rest of the country as well? I believe that uh, we call Sibin Yavanki, also known as Casa Grande Ruins, 
you know, has a place in our story of creation. And with the understanding and um, what would I call the informed public about these ancient and spiritual places that it would foster understanding and respect for these uh, ancestral heritage sites for the Oatham communities as well as the culturally affiliated tribes. And I believe that with that understanding and respect that there would be a great deal more what I call cooperation and working together to preserve these places and also to contribute to our, you know, perpetuation of our uh, traditional way of life. Uh, Mr. Lewis, I just have a few seconds left, but can you tell us very quickly? Um, it's uh, the Casa Grande sits very close to Phoenix, the fastest growing city in the country. I was wondering if you could just very briefly uh just speak to some of the impacts that increased development has had on ancient Holcam sites and landscapes it's a continuous threat for all our ancestral sites here in southern arizona with this rapid economic growth and land development and uh, we're fortunate that there are uh, federal and state mandates in place that require consultation with tribes thank you Thank you so much. I'm afraid that I am out of time. Uh, I thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions. And in fact, I didn't get to all of mine uh, for the witnesses. And we ask that you respond to these in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing and the hearing record will be open for 10 business days for these responses. And again, I thank you all for bearing with me on my technical uh, glitches uh, today. Uh, guarantee that my, uh, my, state, my correct statement will be uh, part of the hearing record. And if there's no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you all again so much. Thank you.